And you, and you think about throughout the 19th century, Walt Whitman, yep. Thoreau, 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 Emerson, Emerson yeah. Walt Whitman's Song of Walt, Myself, Walden's yeah. Pond. Yeah. And I think Walt Whitman's Song of Myself not only captured the unabashed narcissism, but also the effect of that era on our hymns. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. That's a perfectly Gnostic hymn, isn't it? Uh, it's just awful. <laughs> on this edition of the White Horse Inn, I come to the garden alone, a discussion of experience-centered belief. White Horse Inn, know what you believe and why you believe it. Five centuries ago, in taverns and public houses across Europe, the masses would gather for discussion and debate over the latest ideas sweeping the land. From one such meeting place, a small Cambridge inn called the White Horse, the Reformation came to the English-speaking world. Carrying on the tradition of the early reformers, welcome to the White Horse Inn. Hello and welcome to another broadcast of the White Horse Inn. Citing examples from TV, pop music, and best-selling books, an article in Entertainment Weekly noted that pop culture is going gaga for spirituality. However, the writer tells us, seekers of the day are apt to peel away the tough theological stuff and pluck out the most dulcet elements of faith, coming up with a soothing sampler of Judeo-Christian imagery, Eastern meditation, self-help lingo, a vaguely conservative craving for virtue, and a loopy New Age pursuit of peace. This happy free-for-all, appealing to Baptists and stargazers alike, comes off more like Forrest Gump's ubiquitous box of chocolates than like any real system of belief. You never know what you're going to get. End quote. The search for the sacred has become a recurring cover story for national news magazines for a lot of time now. Not only historians and sociologists, but novelists are writing about the Gnostic character of the soup that we call Christianity in the United States today. In an article in Harper's uh, Hot Air Gods, I love the title, Hot Air Gods, uh, very recently, in fact, December 2007, Curtis White describes our situation pretty well. When we assert, this is my belief, says White, we're invoking our right to have our own private conviction, no matter how ridiculous, not only tolerated politically, but respected by others. It says, I've invested a lot of emotional energy in this belief, and in a way, I've staked the credibility of my life on it. So if you ridicule it, you can expect a fight. In this kind of culture, says White, Yahweh and Baal, my God and yours, stroll arm in arm, as if to do so were the model of virtue itself. He goes on to say, What we require of belief is not that it makes sense, but that it be sincere. This is so even for our more secular convictions. Clearly, this is not the spirituality of a centralized orthodoxy. It's a sort of workshop spirituality that you can get with a cereal box top and five dollars. And yet in our culture, to suggest that such belief isn't deserving of respect makes people anxious. An anxiety that expresses itself in the desperate sincerity with which we deliver life's little lessons. There's an obvious problem with this form of spirituality. It takes place in isolation. Each of us sits at our computer terminal, tapping out our convictions. Consequently, it's difficult to avoid the conclusion that our truest belief is the credo of heresy itself. It is heresy without an orthodoxy. No, it's heresy as orthodoxy. When the political freedom of religion has been broadened to the dogma that everyone is free to believe whatever she likes, says White, there is no real shared conviction at all, and hence no church, certainly no community, Strangely, our freedom to believe has achieved the condition that Nietzsche called nihilism, but by a route he never imagined. While European nihilists just denied God, American nihilism is something different. Our nihilism is our capacity to believe in everything and anything all at once. It's all good. White poignantly concludes his essay, We would prefer to be left alone, warmed by our beliefs that make no sense, whether they are the quotidian platitudes of ordinary Americans, the magical thinking of evangelicals, the mystical thinking of New Age Gnostics, the teary-eyed patriotism of conservatives, or the perfivid loyalty of the rich to their free market mammon. We are thus the congregation of the Church of the Infinitely Fractured, splendidly alone together. And apparently that's how we like it. Our pluralism of belief says both to ourselves and to others, keep your distance. 
And yet, isn't this all strangely familiar? Aren't these all the false gods that Isaiah and Jeremiah confronted? The cults of the hot air gods? The gods that couldn't scare birds from a cucumber patch? Belief of every kind in cult, self-indulgence, and self-aggrandizement of every degree all flourish here. And yet God is abandoned. End quote. And that comes from a non-Christian and the magazine Harper's. So the search for the sacred is really another round of American heresy as orthodoxy, the flight of the lonely Gnostic soul from nowhere to nowhere, where prisoners of our own subjectivity confined to the tiny cell of our own limited experiences, expectations, and felt needs. And we're going to talk about this as part of the situation in America that we're calling today Christless Christianity. As we do this with Kim Riddlebarger, pastor of Christ Reformed Church in Anaheim, California, Dr. Rod Rosenblatt, professor at Concordia University in Irvine and a Lutheran minister, and the Reverend Ken Jones, pastor of Greater Union Baptist Church, to whom this all appeals, since it appeals to Baptists and stargazers alike. <laughs> and I'm Mike Horton. I teach at Westminster Seminary in California. Pretty interesting, isn't it? Especially that essay from White. Yeah. Uh, wow, he's an, a novelist, and he's explicit there that he's not writing this as a Christian at all. A lot of non-Christians get that what's going on here is really ancient heresy, not contemporary conservative orthodoxy. Yeah, it's it's amazing. We In uh, some of our previous shows, we've quoted from Neil Gabler and from Neil Postman, and um, it's, it's amazing how outsiders get what the problem is. Even if they don't embrace the solution, they right. understand the shift that's taking place within uh, Christian circles, whereas those of us who are on the inside, many of our leaders um, in, in the academy as well as in the local church are defending yeah. the very thing yeah. Yeah. that these outsiders are saying is wrong. Wow. Yeah. yeah. You know, when, you, when you're outside the circle and you're looking at things historically, you can see things a bit clearer yeah. Yeah. than for inside the circle trying to please your constituency. Well, as far back as the early 18th century, the French commentator Alexis de Tocqueville observed the distinctly American craving, quote, to escape from all imposed systems and to seek by themselves and in themselves mm. for the only reasons for things, wow. looking to results without getting entangled in the means toward them. So mm. each man is narrowly shut up in himself and from that basis makes the pretension to judge the world. He says, Americans do not need books or any other external authorities in order to find truth, having found it within themselves. Mm. And, and you think about you know, thereafter, throughout the 19th century, Walt Whitman, yep. Thoreau, 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 Emerson, Emerson yeah. Walt Whitman's Song Walt, of Myself. Walden's yeah. Pond. Yeah. And I think Walt Whitman's Song of Myself not only captured the unabashed narcissism of American romanticism, but also the effect of that era on our hymns. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses, and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. That's a perfectly Gnostic hymn, isn't it? Uh -huh. <laughs> it's just awful. Uh -huh. It's so awful. Uh -huh. Goes right back to Curtis White's uh, comment that uh, we are thus the congregation of the Church of the Infinitely Fractured, splendidly alone together. <laughs> yeah, I mean that. Wow. Yeah. that is. That's so well stated. The idea <laughs> is like, perfect. Get a, when, when he says that I really believe this. What we're really saying is, no matter how silly, no matter how stupid, no matter how completely irrational and unbelievable my belief is, I've invested a lot of emotional energy in this. Back off. Yeah. Isn't the religion of American evangelicalism the personal relationship with Jesus? Oh, yeah, it absolutely. is. Well, the whole idea of the born again experience, if you look at what Reformation evangelicals were, people who adhered to the five solas, Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone, glory to God alone, and you were to identify yourself as an evangelical in the post Reformation era, that meant you were basically committed to those doctrinal truths. Today, when you say you're an evangelical and you're part of the evangelical movement, what unites you together is a, a common shared experience of being born again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's not as though we're depreciating the biblical necessity of being born again. Scripture says you must be born again. In fact, Jesus said we must be born again. 
but Jesus is telling us that you will in fact be born again uh-huh. by well, the preaching of the gospel. That's that, that that very notion of the born again experience being really the pinnacle of of the Christian experience. It goes hand in hand with this lusting after everybody's personal story. You know, what they want are personal testimonies. So people yeah. feel the need to spice them up or they they pontificate eloquently about what the Lord has done for them. And it's not that these things are not important, but it's just that my personal story is, is really not that important. It's the same as everyone else's. I was born in sin. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the sheer... Immediacy.